Mountain Springs, what's going on this morning? You guys doing good? Yeah, Bobby's right. You guys sound awesome this morning. Hey, my name is Evan. I'm on team here at Mountain Springs. Excited to be able to be with you guys this morning. If you have your Bible, uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 9, and we're continuing this series called Go Boldly, and uh, we're just kind of working our way through the book of Acts, and we've reached Acts 9, and I love, love this portion of scripture, and we're just going to jump right in this morning, if that's cool with you guys. Actually, I don't care. We're just going to do it. Acts 9, verse 1, it says this, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, any Christians, any who professed the name of Jesus, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed all around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Verse 8, Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat and did not drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias, and the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, "Um, you sure? I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm and all the destruction and all the havoc that he has wreaked and he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Still sure? But the Lord said to Ananias, go with an exclamation point. You know, if there's an exclamation point, Jesus is serious. All right, go. This man is my, I love this, chosen instrument. Everyone say chosen instrument. instrument. Oh, y'all sound good this morning. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Verse 17, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, brother Saul. The Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And then I love that they threw verse 19 in there. He had a good meal and regained his strength. He was no longer hangry. Do you know what I hate? This is what I hate. I hate being scared. I do. I hate being scared more than anything else. It makes no sense to me to tell someone, here, take my money, now try and scare me. Doesn't, I don't do scary movies. I don't even do scary trailers before the movies, all right? When I was in high school, I went to a scary movie. I think it was the last one that I've ever been to. And in this movie, there was this girl, and she went to sleep, and she was in her bed, and this, like, the thing of the movie manifested itself in her bed, and there was a big bump, and she woke up, and it was coming up to get her, and it got her. And so when I got home, I was like, there is no way I'm sleeping in my bed tonight. Like, it is not happening. Where's the safest place on the floor in the living room with ESPN, God's channel on? Like that is the safest place that I can think of. And you better believe at 2 a.m. I woke up to a blob coming underneath my blankets at me. And I'm telling you, I kicked that cat in the face harder than I've ever kicked anything (laughs) in my entire life. All right. Calm down. It wasn't a dog, just a cat. (laughs) We're, We're okay. Stay, stay with me. Stay with me. I don't, do, I don't do scary stuff. I don't do haunted houses. Like no part of me ever wants to do a haunted house. When I was a sophomore in high school, I went to a haunted house. And you might be thinking, Evan, why did you go to the haunted house? Listen, the power of a pretty girl in high school is unmatched, okay? There is, 
And she was begging me to go. She was. She was like, Evan, do you think maybe you'd want to go to a haunted house this weekend? How do you say no to that? You don't, okay? And so I spent the rest of the week just prepping myself, preparing myself for this haunted house. You know, there's nothing real in there, man. Like, it's all a bunch of pimply-faced kids with masks on. They just want to scare you and get you and jump out at you. So I practiced every corner that I walked by. I pretended something was going to jump out at me and how I would react and how I would respond. And I felt pretty good going into the night. And we walked into the first room. And in the first room, there was like these strobe lights going off, and there was this girl wearing all this makeup, and she was in a cage, and she was just screaming. And I realized that had no effect on me. Like, I was good. That didn't scare me at all. I was like, girl, you need Jesus. Watch some sports center when you get home. You'll be taken care of, all right? Like, this was fine. And I realized, like, it's not the visual. It's not the sound. Like, that stuff doesn't scare me. I realized very quickly what really scares me is the unexpected. Because when we walked into that next room and that dude in the scary clown mask and the air horn jumped out at me, I punched him straight in the throat. (laughs) It was just my first reaction. Was there a high-pitched scream when I swung at him? Not the point, all right? (laughs) It's not what this message is about. I just, I hate, I hate being scared. And so when I, when I read stories in scripture of like angels showing up and manifesting themselves and Jesus showing up in the physical form, it makes me a little nervous. Okay. Like I, I, nobody wants to be the guy that accidentally tries to punch Jesus in the throat when he shows up. Like you just don't want to be that person. But this is what I love about Acts 9. I love it. It's because Acts 9 shows us that it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter who you think you are, when you are in the presence of God, in the presence of Jesus, there's only one response and you hit your knees. That's it. I mean, think about this story that we've been given. Think about the characters in this story. Think about who this guy is. Most of us, if we have any sort of church background at all, we know the name Paul. We know who Paul is. He's written most of the New Testament. If you open your Bible into the New Testament, you'll probably fall on one of, one of his books, the book of Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Philippians, Ephesians, Galatians, all these books written by Paul to try and instruct the church and to have a healthy church and to love your neighbor and to bring others up to where you are and to just be there for people. But before Paul was Paul, he was Saul. And Saul was a different cat. The first time we see Saul is in chapter 8, verse 1, and this is the murder of Stephen, and it says Saul is the one there who gave the approval to kill Stephen. Fast forward a couple of verses, and in in verse 3 in chapter 8, it says that Saul now has the sole mission to destroy the church. That's all he wants to do. His sole purpose in life is to destroy the church of Jesus. By the time we get to chapter 9, it says the anger and the zeal in, Paul's, in Saul's heart has grown so much that he is asking the chief priest, the high priest, for permission to go to Damascus, which was like 150 miles away. It would have taken over a week to travel one way there because he heard rumors that there might be Christians there. And he wanted to go find them and drag them back to Jerusalem to be thrown into prison, to be beaten, to be tortured, and for many of them to be killed simply for professing the name of Jesus. See, Saul was literally a terrorist. He used his religious views to instill fear onto others of a different religious belief, and he wanted to destroy everything about them. And this is what I love about this story, because it shows us the heart of Jesus. Because I want you to see this. Saul does nothing in this story or before this story to deserve Jesus to show up for him. Saul does nothing to deserve Jesus to set him on this new trajectory. Saul does nothing to deserve Jesus to come and to help him and to show him the light. But Jesus shows up anyways. Jesus chases him down anyways. And this is the theme, the reoccurring theme, all the way from Genesis 1 to November 5th, 2017 and beyond. God showing up for people who don't deserve it. That's it. That's what this whole book is about. That is what our whole life is. That's what this church is about. God showing up for people who don't deserve it. So Jesus shows up and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And this is a great question because it teaches us something about Jesus. Because Saul wasn't persecuting Jesus. He was persecuting the church. He was persecuting Christians. And what Jesus is saying in this moment is, this is my creation. These are my people. If they hurt, I hurt. If they feel broken, I feel broken. If they're rejoicing, I'm rejoicing. Whatever they're going through, I'm going through. You go after them, you come after me. And it's not just 2,000 years ago. It's the same today. This is Jesus' church. 
And if anything, whether from the world or from spiritual forces comes after this church, it goes after Jesus. And Jesus is saying, I will stand with you until the end of your life, and then I will stand with you for all of eternity, and nothing will come in between you and me. We are one. He says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? These are my people. And then he gives Saul this directive. He gives him a job. He says, I want you to go into Damascus and wait for me there. And I love this because this is, teaches us something very important about not just Saul's life or Jesus, but your life as well. Because even though Saul has had a crazy encounter with Jesus, even though he has met the living, breathing Jesus, even though something amazing has happened in his life, he's been given a directive and it is completely and absolutely up to Saul to respond, to choose what he is going to do next. See, he could have easily gone back to Jerusalem. This is what I know. This is where I've been. This is what I'm familiar with. This is what I, I know I can go back there and I'll have a support system. And, and I know I can go back there and go right back into my prestige and my power and my influence. I know I can go back there. Or he could have continued on to Damascus on his original mission. Maybe now even angrier than before because now Jesus made me blind and now I'm really upset. And he could have continued on. This is the mission I set off on, I set off upon, and I'm going to finish it no matter what. Or... There's the third option. He could obey Jesus. He could say, I could go back, I could keep on my original mission, or I can listen to what Jesus is calling me to do, is telling me to do in my heart. And even though it doesn't make sense, even though it is illogical and it is crazy, I could listen and obey to that. And we know that's what he does. See, this isn't the only time in the book of Acts that this story is mentioned. It's actually mentioned two other times in chapter 22 and chapter 26, except those two times is from the transformed Paul's perspective. It's him sharing his testimony. It's him telling people what happened to him and the craziness that went down. And in chapter 22, he says that the companions that I was with, the Roman soldiers that I was with, they heard this sound and they saw something crazy happen, but they didn't understand any of it. They didn't understand a word that was said. But then when you go back to Acts chapter 9, it says that these companions, they led Saul by the hand into Damascus and to the right house. So that shows us that Saul stood up, he realized he was blind, and he then had to explain to his companions what they were to do next. Guys, I know this was our original mission, and this is what we were originally set off to do, but we're going to change it because Jesus has spoken into my heart, and he's spoken into my life, and I want you to lead me by the hand and take me. This is the house that I'm supposed to go to, and I'm going to wait there. As crazy as it sounds, he chose to obey and to follow Jesus. I want you to see this this morning. The question is the same for you. What are you going to do? See, Jesus has given us all a directive. He's spoken into all of our hearts. He's given us all a mission and a purpose. And you have three options. You can go back to what you know. You can go back to the lifestyle that you've always had. Maybe it's full of addictions or full of things that you know aren't great, but you know what? It's comfortable. It's familiar. It's easy. I know that section of my life. Or maybe you got like some 10-year plan that you're just like so focused on. You're like, man, that's what I want to achieve. That's what I want to accomplish. That's what I want to do with my life. And maybe you're starting to realize maybe that's not what God wants to do in my life, but I've already started. And so I'm going to follow that and I'm just going to complete that and then we'll come back and revisit this. Or... Maybe you can listen to what Jesus is calling you to do and say, this makes no sense. This is illogical. This is crazy. But you know what? I'll trust you. I'll follow you. I'll obey what you have for me. So it says Saul goes into Damascus. He decides to trust Jesus. And, and Jesus shows up to this brother named Ananias. And he's like, yo, Ananias, I need you to go find Saul. And Ananias is like, excuse me? You want me to do what? Jesus, I know you've been like hanging out in heaven. I don't know if you got your feet kicked back and people are feeding you grapes. I don't know what's going on in there, but maybe you haven't been paying attention. But do you know who Saul is? Saul has been wreaking havoc on your church. He has been destroying your church. Ananias probably knows people that have been thrown in prison, have been beaten, have been tortured, maybe have been killed because of Saul. And now he's coming to my neighborhood. He's coming to my neck of the woods. He's coming to my house to try and find me. And if we would run into each other in the street, he would throw me in prison and probably have me killed. Are you sure you want me to go talk to him? And Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, yeah I am. 
Go talk to him. He says, Jesus, are you purposefully sending me into danger? And Jesus is like, yeah, I am. Because we see crazy things throughout Scripture. That when someone's obedience to God outweighs their fear of what could happen. What could God do in this community if our obedience to his call outweighed our fear of what could happen? What would that look like in your life if your obedience to Jesus' call in your life outweighed your fear of what could happen? Jesus sends Ananias into what he perceived as danger so that millions down the road could receive freedom. Where is Jesus sending you? What seems crazy and scary for you? What decision are you needing to make in your life? That doesn't seem like it makes any sense, but I guarantee you, if you trust and you obey Jesus, you will see the miraculous happen. Because it's illogical. And it doesn't make sense. If a miracle happens that is logical, not a miracle. It's supposed to happen. Where is Jesus sending you? The band, you guys can come on back up. I love what the transformed Paul what he says in, in chapter 22. He describes this situation for when Ananias shows up at, at the house that Saul is at and how Ananias greets him. It says that Ananias shows up and he says, he stood beside me. He didn't condemn me. He didn't judge me. He didn't make me confess everything I'd ever done. He didn't make me explain all the mistakes I had. He walked in. He stood beside me. He lifted me up. He called me brother. Can I talk to the, the, the Christians in the room right now, like those who profess a relationship with Jesus? Let's just like sidebar right now really quick. Who is Jesus calling you to? Whose heart has Jesus been working on? Whose heart has Jesus been softening and been doing a work in their life? Maybe they don't even realize it yet, but he has been working in their life and he's saying, okay, I've set the table for you. Go and meet with them. Maybe they're, they're sitting next to you this morning. Don't point. Don't look at them. Just eyes up here. Maybe it's a text that you need to send when you leave here. Maybe it's a phone call you need to make. Maybe a social media message that you need to send out. Who is Jesus calling you to in this moment that he's saying, man, I've got a call for them. I've got a purpose for them. I just need you to show up and to stand beside them and to lift them up and show them the love that I have for them. Ooh. It's about to get good. <laughs> Who is Jesus calling you to? Who heart is he working on? Because I love what it says. Scripture goes on. It says that Saul is healed because Ananias shows up and Ananias prays over him and he, he, he explains the gospel to him and the scales fall off his eyes. And, and it says this, he accepts the mission to advance the gospel at all costs in that moment. He accepts the mission to follow Jesus no matter what. And then you fast forward to the end of Acts chapter 9 and verse 31. It says the church is strengthened and continues to grow in numbers because Saul decided I'm going to live for Jesus. No matter what it looks like, no matter how crazy it is, I'm going to live for Jesus. And this is probably the best moment of Saul's life because even though it sent him on his earthly trajectory towards his earthly death, it opened the gates for his eternal salvation. And that's exciting. And so what we got to ask ourselves is, is why have we been given this story? What is Jesus trying to teach us through this story? Not one time, but three times. In Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26. Why do we get this story three times? Are we listening this morning? Are we listening because Paul wants to show us something. The transformed Paul says, I've had an experience. I have met Jesus. I have met the only thing that can transform. I've met the only thing, the only person that can give hope, that can bring salvation, that can give purpose and mission. I have met the only one in this world. You can have all these accomplishments and you can have popularity and you can have a great salary, but there's only one person and only one thing in this entire universe that saves and completely and absolutely transforms and it's Jesus. 
And you can look through the rest of Paul's writings, how he begins to unfold this and to describe it. Because in Romans chapter 3, he says, everyone has fallen short of the glory of God, but we can be freely justified by grace. How? Because of Jesus. And in Romans chapter 7, he says, what a wretched man I am. Who can save me? God alone. How? Because of Jesus. And in Romans 8, he says, therefore, there is now no condemnation. Why? Because of Jesus. And in Philippians 3, he says, everything I've accomplished, everything I've gained, everything I've been given in this world, it is now considered trash, rubbish, garbage. Why? Because I've met Jesus. Jesus is the only thing that transforms. Jesus is the only person that saves. Are we listening to what Paul is trying to tell us? Are we paying attention to what God is putting in front of us? I love this. In chapter 22, verse 16, the transformed Paul describes how Ananias comes in and what he says to him. He says, he walked in and he said, you've now seen and you've heard. What are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash your sins away, and call on the name of Jesus. The question for us this morning is the same. You've now seen and you've heard. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? What we're going to do right now is we're going to go into a time of worship. And I know there are some in this room right now that you have, you've got a relationship with Jesus and you believe without a shadow of a doubt that he has risen from the grave, that death has been conquered, that the enemy has been defeated. And when we sing this song, I want you to sing from the top of your lungs and I want you to shake the gates of hell with your worship and let the enemy know that he has lost and our God has won. Some of you in this room right now, you've never accepted that relationship with Jesus. You've never maybe even been confronted with it. Let me say this again. You've now seen and you've heard. What are you waiting for? You are so loved. You, there's a purpose and a mission waiting for you. As we sing, maybe you'll sing these words and believe them for the very first time. Come on, just sing it out. Praise the God who transforms and who has saved you. If you've already committed to being baptized at the end of the service, when this song starts, just go ahead and head over to this side wall and we'll get you taken care of. Because after this song, we're gonna party and we're gonna celebrate some baptisms and it's gonna be a good time. You guys ready for that? Yeah. God, we love you. We love you. And I just pray right now, as your spirit just falls in this room, for those who already have a relationship with you, I pray that you put a name on their heart that you put a name on their heart, that you've been softening their heart already, a name that they're supposed to go to and say, hey, I will stand next to you. I will love you. I will lift you up. I will call you brother. I will call you sister because of what Jesus has done for us. God, I pray for those in this room right now that have never experienced this love. I pray for those in this room right now whose heart has never accepted this gift that you have given them. I pray that you would speak in the name of Jesus into their heart right now, right here, and you would let them know how loved they are and what you have done for them on the cross and how the tomb is empty so that they can walk into eternity. God, we love you and we praise you. And it's in your name we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. If you're willing, would you stand and worship with us?